what are you saying? I was the lucky one because I get to present on these. Uh, this is Teton and Johnstown, probably two of the more common ones that people are familiar with. Who's familiar with Teton at least? Almost everyone. So these are two of our newest validation studies. So that's really why I was lucky because I didn't have to add too many slides or anything to this. Uh, both these case studies, LifeSim done by Jordan McMaster, Kurt Buchanan from the Modeling Mapping Consequence Center within USACE, Hydraulic Sum by HDR. So Teton Dam. Again, this is probably the one you're most familiar with, but if you're not, uh, our just general reminder, very large dam, USBR dam, uh, built in the 70s, and it failed during its first fill. So this was, you know, an untested sort of project as it was coming up. You can kind of see the general region we're talking about here in eastern Idaho. And, you know, very tall dam. Um, I won't give you all the background, the geotech sort of stuff here, because we're focusing on life sim. But you can see, again, I mean, what's relevant here is tall dam, uh, fairly significant amount of water, and, uh, you know, it... but there's images I hadn't seen before when Jordan put this presentation together. You can see here at 1015, breach kind of progressing somewhat, you know, not really formed in, into the main embankment yet, but starting to cave in there a little bit. 1045, so now this is the famous, you know, two dozers kind of pushing dirt into the hole. Uh, they're trying to intervene, uh, and, you know, unfortunately, uh, their efforts were stopped by the dozers falling into the hole. Both of them survived looking on, but now you can see just this continued progression. Now we're at 1120 a.m. Uh, intervention, trying to obviously not uh, succeeding thus far. So Whirlpool forming the reservoir in this 11 o'clock sort of hour. 1130, we're almost to the crest now with progression here. And then 1150, we're right at that moment, basically. Um, it fails, operators being rescued off of, uh, you know, that almost falling into the hole there. 1155, so this is really where, you know, where we would say in life sim, uh, when, when is the moment the hazard occurs? Because pretty much everything else time-wise is going to be based off of this moment, right? So when it the, connects to the reservoir, really, is when we generally start to say, okay, in RAS, here's when the breach starts expanding from, you know, zero to something. And uh, this is when we would want to start, uh, you know, when warning and everything else would be relative within life sim. So you can see, again, uh, just the full widening of this breach over the course of really just a few hours here. Looking downstream of that first image, or downstream you can see there, you know, it took 11 hours, again, from when it was leakage was first spotted. Uh, from this incident that, uh, at least that we're aware of, you know, six of these are direct. This is what life sim really focuses on, you know, people that made contact with water. What's kind of interesting, though, that only two were non-residential and they started inside that inundated area. Uh, one of the others was a recreator uh, fishing downstream, not someone that we traditionally put in our, at least, you know, off the shelves for structure inventories. Three of the others started outside the inundated area. They came to help move contents from somebody's structure that was within the inundated area. So that's a little bit non-traditional, but you know, arguably something that would still be in the inventory that you would be using. So five indirect. Jesse's going to be talking about indirect after lunch, but general idea here again, if you're unfamiliar, you know, some of these people uh, accidentally shot themselves when they were trying to gather contents and flee. Others had heart attacks and things like that. You know, they given this incredible warning that we're going to be hearing a little bit. Uh, and, you know, that can take people by surprise, cause some stress that, you know, could lead to these increased rate of heart attacks and whatnot. So all these impacts we're looking at, over 700 homes destroyed, thousands more damaged, livestock, businesses, a lot of things disrupted in the downstream area. 
here you can see uh, the dam in the top right and the modeled inundated area going on here. So again, this is Teton Canyon immediately below the dam. This is where that fisher person was, fisherman. Uh, and then Wilford is the main community that was uh, affected, at least for a direct life loss. This is where uh, the Two lives were lost, or five direct fatality, two that were lived there, and then the three others that came into the inundated area. Sugar City, uh, still, you know, 15 uh, foot flood wave, but uh, further downstream, no fatalities recorded. Uh, likewise, Rexburg, so the flood's starting to attenuate somewhat, six to eight feet, even further downstream, 2.5 hours flood arrival. Uh, this is where some of the indirect life loss occurred, but uh, no direct life loss. Idaho Falls. You know, minimal flooding, uh, 12 hours downstream, a lot of sandbanging going on. So they're kind of flood fight to protect the community. Uh, I'm not sure if, if I'm not familiar enough with this to say, oh, yeah, that is what did it, or just the fact that they're so far downstream that is even more attenuated, but another indirect life loss there. So I was trying to validate in this life sim. Uh, what they worked on was creating a structure inventory for this dam failure that happened in the 70s, right? So there's no... NSI 2022 that you would want to use for something that happened in the 70s. So what they tried to do is go back to historic records. This is aerial imagery and other sort of documents that suggest that here's where we know uh, structures were located at that time. So we're going to try to create inventories that represent uh, what existed at the time of the event. You know, a, a lot of work, a lot of different variations they tried on saying, oh, there's some documents with competing ideas of exactly how many structures were there. Um, but they tr tried a few different sensitivities, which I forget if are in these presentations, but ended up with something that was pretty remarkable. I mean, you can kind of see some of the georeferencing that they're trying to do, you know, just setting up grid lines and whatnot um, to correspond with some of these other images to try to get a, as reasonable enough count of the structures and their rough characteristics as they could. Population distribution, same thing, you know, in the 70s, uh, you can't just pull in today's census data, but there are some records from back then. You know, you can break this out into these different sort of EPZs we're getting a little sneak peek at, but here are counties and city boundaries that are helpful for saying who existed within those jurisdictional boundaries at the time, and you can pull that into the structure inventory that you created. So 1976 population estimates were interpolated between 70s and 80s data. Uh, to try to get an idea of, of who was in there. Again, that's a little bit tricky in some of these situations where it's like, okay, did people move out? You know, that was a huge concern in the Katrina thing. So there is going to be some uncertainty about the true population in any particular year when we're going this far back. So then once we have, you know, who lived within the general county and city boundaries, you have to say, okay, how do you distribute those among uh, structures? And what he's saying here with this FIA ask. FIA was kind of the predecessor to LifeSim. Uh, there was a somewhat simplified methodology that was common in there in some of the early versions of the NSI, where we basically assigned weights to different occupancy types. So if you're a single family household, you get a weight of one. If you're a multi-family structure that has like, you know, two units in it, okay, then you get double the amount of population as the neighboring single family household. And 50 units, okay, you get 50 times as many. And then non-residential structures, you get more weight in the day than you do at night to just try to distribute that population. It's not perfect, but something reasonable enough where you get higher population in the residential structures for, um, you know, where you want them to be. EPZs, emergency planning zones. So trying to break this out a little bit because, uh, you know, one, it may have been useful for him trying to work through the population assignment aspect of this, but two, uh, warning and uh, evacuations all differed throughout some of these areas. So we're getting into the timeline now again. So on the top, we had all of what happened in terms of what's going on at the dam. Now at the bottom, we're talking about how did warning and uh, evacuation go about. So recreation employees notify the, of the leakage at 820 and they arrived at the dam at nine o'clock. So even though something was kind of noted at 7 a.m., it takes you know a couple hours before uh, people that have more authority are arriving on site, so there's some delay. There are all this discussion about how serious the problem is, so they show up and they don't immediately say, oh no, let's warn people downstream. There's deliberation of like, okay, is this a true threat to the dam or is this a problem that we can solve now? So there's a notification to downstream sheriffs 
that at 1043, that there's a possibility the dam might go, but it would go slowly. So, you know, a lot of CYA here probably, um, a lot of maybe we can still get this sort of thing, but just FYI, you know, maybe the dam could go, you know, no big deal. It's, it's not the strongest language, right? I mean, this isn't the sort of thing that compel the sheriff to immediately start uh, issuing evacuation orders necessarily. So th this, you know, two minutes later, uh, this is when dozers are reacting to this sort of situation here. So again, not necessarily what you would expect what would be going on on the warning side, given the circumstances at the dam. So personnel requests sheriff issue a complete evacuation of all low-lying areas below Teton Dam. Uh, this is happening at 11, 11.30. And again, you know, this is when breach is really pretty much there at this time. But uh, what's, you know, really saved the downstream population in this case is that uh, their warning didn't have to go through all these official channels, or not entirely anyway. There were enough rumblings of all this stuff was going on that some radio personnel came to the area. These are people that were, you know, trusted by the local communities. They're seeing what's happening live, you know, with their own eyes and reporting from the scene, essentially, and are able to tell people, you know, some of these quotes here, if you're able to read them, uh, you know, get out, get out now. Teton Dan has failed monumental volumes of water coming. You hear a message like that, Okay, that doesn't meet all the, you know, five criteria or whatever that we had up on the screen the other day, source, uh, location, threat, and everything. Still fairly compelling language of this is a very serious situation. This isn't like a nuisance flood or something that may or may not affect you. This is, you know, essentially, oh, my God, you know, run for your life sort of language. So now we're kind of looking at this range, though, of like, this is when some of the warnings started to become, you know, going out to the public. So there's some, going to be some uncertainty about here. If we're trying to model this event in life sim. When did that warning actually go out? So what they're trying to accomplish here is like, okay, we're going to set up a triangular note of our uh, triangular distribution and say, okay, uh, it, maybe it goes out in some scenarios, 1045, maybe it's 1130, just to try to get that in the model of, of you know, some uncertainty of when people actually start responding to this sort of stuff. So 1045 is when, you know, that sheriff started getting notified. 11, 1130 is when the sheriffs also start working on it when some of that radio stuff is going out. So somewhere in this area is really when warnings uh, started. With this example, we have to make some guesswork of exactly how fast the warnings got out, of exactly how fast people responded. But there are there is some evidence of what uh, happened downstream because you know there are a lot of interviews with local officials and people downstream after the fact. There's also just evidence of hey, we know you know 90% of the structures collapsed, and we know you know roughly how many people died in there and how many structures were therefore empty, and a lot of the other cases. Uh, there are a lot of, again, interviews that happen after the fact. And, you know, I was asking the modeler behind this, like, are you familiar with any interviews of people, like, being in their house and getting washed away and stuff like that? And, and we couldn't think of any. So th there's some general guidelines of saying, okay, then maybe we can use this as a lower bound. Uh, maybe we'll take some of the after-the-fact statements of we got everyone out or we got 99% of the people out at face value and use that for upper bounds, et cetera. So without road network is the first idea and this is trying a lot of different permutations of like let's assume a really fast warning or let's assume a slower warning uh, let's assume a really fast mobilization rate you know given these facets uh how well did we do and this gets into the whole validating the model versus validating the approach a little bit you know if we knew exactly uh how many people evacuated when then we could evac uh validate some of the other parts of the model right if we knew hey, they, they all evacuated, they were in their house. Did we correctly predict whether or not their house is gonna get washed away? Okay, we can validate the structure stability part of it, but it's really hard to validate the whole thing at once without like getting into the approach part of it as well. So here's an example of moderate warning, moderate uh, evacuation. So 98% mobilized, what the life loss is. You can see in almost all these cases, or really all these cases, mean and median, 
Uh, some of these cases, the mins do extend into that target range, and that target life loss, you know, Jordan is arguing here, is the two lives that happen of the people that both live there and direct life loss. Observed direct life loss includes, uh, I believe, not the fishermen, but the three people that came into the study as well. So, you know, it's kind of debatable, should we be targeting that blue line or red line, but somewhere around there is where we kind of want to be, and clearly we're high in almost all these cases. So where is life loss occurring? You know, here's a basically a, a heat map of life loss, and you can see it's generally occurring where it actually occurred, you know, immediately below the dam, going to be having more severe hydraulic conditions, still a fair amount of people there, so that's where life loss is happening. But we are seeing some direct life loss further downstream where we know it didn't occur. So this is just 3% of downstream PAR in this uh, Wilford area. Uh, well, six resides in some of these further downstream areas. So again, very small part of the PAR, but a uh, disproportionate amount of life loss in the top right. So Wilford rise after breach, just 20 minutes, Sugar City 1.5, Rexburg 2.5. So how do we do once on that uh, structure collapse aspect of it? Well, we know roughly 132 out of 154 structures washed away. So there were some sensitivities done on, okay, let's assume wood buoyant. Uh, we modeled 95 out of 164, so low on that end, wood buoyant light. Uh, okay, still low, but you know, general ballpark in a lot of these unknown. So uh, sampling between these and, okay, we're in between those and the collapse method or anchored which is, you know, it takes more and more water basically for the anchored uh, to wash it away, and so even less of a miss. So not bad, I would say, on this front. Um, in all these cases, we underestimated how many people uh, are, how many structures foundations and things like that. So maybe not entirely surprising that we're underestimating how many structures got washed away in these cases. It may also be, for all we know, the hydraulics aren't perfect. Um, there's going to be a few different things that could uh, cause us to miss there. But here you can see, and you guys are fairly familiar, I guess, with these at this point of their uh, different structure stability criteria. So when playing around with it, you know, again, okay, in the total numbers, how'd we do? Not bad. And you can also see in the spatial location of some of this, how'd we do? Not bad, I'd say. So you can see in here the wood anchors, uh, what structures actually are getting washed away in most iterations, that's what's going on, on the right, versus, you know, direct observed data on the left. And you can see in a lot of these cases of hey, here's where we recorded structures being washed away, and it corresponds fairly well in where we predicted it. Uh, here's a reference area, and if we hop over from wood anchored to wood buoyant on So I mentioned before, it's like, hey, uh, Lysim is very flexible. Depending on what you put in there, you can almost get it to give you any number you want. So if we're trying to say we don't really know what the actual PAI, PAI rates were, but let's play around with that, do some sensitivity, moving from 95% you know, mobilized in this example to 98%. How, do, how does life loss correspond? It seems to be like, okay, we get right on target if we assume 99% uh, or 98% or so evacuated. And I'd say that corresponds fairly well with some of the reports that came out after the fact, especially with some of those further downstream communities where it's, you know, sheriff said after the fact, oh, we got everyone out. And it's like, sometimes it's hard for them to know that. Like, did you actually go by every single house and search every house? Or, you know, maybe there are some people uh, that did get flooded and they survived and they just, you know, didn't tell the sheriff or something like that, or he failed to mention it. Uh, but I'd say, you know, that makes me feel pretty good because I think it probably is true that 98, 99% evacuation rates occurred in some of these areas. So what happens when we add road network in, uh, pulled in from you know, current uh, OpenStreetMap data, so maybe some roads have changed. Uh, so they calibrate that a little bit. You know, again, trying to pull in uh, some com contemporary data, I suppose, from the, the time to modify the road networks putting destinations on major roadways. Uh, 
again, since we're uncertain about how people responded, we're going to do some sensitivity on that. How do we do? Uh, fairly low life loss on roads, uh, four there, three there, three there, uh, which, you know, is positive in the literal sense. Uh, but uh, in reality, no life loss occurred on roads in these incidents, at least not direct life loss. Yeah, go ahead. Stability criteria is used for vehicles today. Mm. Uh, no, I, I don't, not that I'm aware of at least. And so it probably had the same distribution of high and low clearance and everything. Um, it almost, yeah, shouldn't matter too much. Again, I'm not familiar with any recorded instance of people like driving through flooded water. Probably happened, don't know. There are recorded instances of people in their vehicle, flood wave literally almost behind them and everything and, and reaching safety. There are a lot of close calls, um, but, you know, those are the stories I've read more of than like, you know, okay, I drove through the water and um, barely made it out sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So here's where life loss occurred in the, in the model. Uh, you can kind of see up there, okay, it's happening in the eastern side where you would expect more severe conditions. A lot of destinations all along through here. So again, th there's going to be some uncertainty, like did people drive in these directions we modeled them to? Maybe that's why. So is the model's fault that we added in three extra life loss, or is it, you know, the application's fault? It's hard to I've seen a lot of other people do. So at the very least, it's kind of a hitting on that whole uh, application approach of it. You know, um, maybe we're overestimating because we don't get the destination and traffic flow patterns quite right in our approach. So again, uh, going back to this idea of validating our approach. So the MMC, if you're unfamiliar with, is a group that does a lot of our at least uh, low level, you know, screening level analyses within the core. Uh, if a project is kind of starting out or it's uh, going through a routine sort of analysis, usually the MMC will come through and, and do that first uh, analysis that if a dam shows that it's at high risk, okay, there'll be a more detailed approach or more detailed analysis uh, later on top of that later. But using our, you know, standard operating procedure for this, which usually assumes extremely wide uncertainty around pretty much every parameter, like, oh, we'll have the minimal and ample warning scenarios, like zero to two hours before breach or two to six hours. Sort of a, you know, parameters. Well, the, we missed by even more than what was assumed in a lot of those custom things. And, you know, that's not too surprising from the mean and median perspective, but it is concerning to me at least of, hey, our minimum is like way outside the bounds. We're assuming these totally wide distributions to try to like say, we don't really know what's going on. So let's try to allow for as much uncertainty as possible, but we're still missing. You know, why is that? Um, you know, I kind of raised this discussion and Jordan brought up, well, in a certain aspect, Teton Dam was almost a best case scenario for how people respond to getting a warning. I mean, it absolutely wasn't a best case scenario on how much time they had to respond, but, you know, they responded extremely quickly. You know, a lot of these populations had less than a couple hours to get out of harm's way, and we think, you know, 98% plus of them did. You know, that, that's incredible compared to, you know, just the hazard literature in general. Uh, you almost never see 98% evacuation rates, let alone evacuation rates that quickly. Um, and so, you know, kind of theorizing here, suggesting, well, why did they respond so quickly? Well, maybe it was a trust sort of aspect of it. You know, they trusted this radio announcer. It's an extremely tight-knit community. Uh, most of them were members of the same church. Uh, you know, it was uh, early in the day, but not like, you know, 5 a.m. or something like that. So people were awake. People were listening to media. People were getting ready to go about their day anyway. So you didn't have to raise anyone out of uh, sleep. You know, they could see daylight for their evacuation sort of purposes, a lot of that, you know, is kind of a best case scenario for in terms of how people respond. You know, that wasn't still fully satisfactory to me, though, because it's like, okay, well, it's a best case scenario, but that means we should still have our range to incorporate that in some way. And I was a little bit confused because we just did this whole um, revamp of our evacuation rates and stuff, too. So, like, I would hope that it would be within the range, at least and asked Jordan to look into it. And yeah, it is within the range. Like what we think happened is this dotted yellow line. 
And yes, uh, we think it's at the upper end of what we allow for, but it's in what we allow for. So why didn't our life loss results capture that within the range? And part of the thing we look into is like, okay, uh, we set this up with many different EPZs because we think evacuation rates were slightly higher in some of the cities. Uh, you know, again, we just generally break things out by county a whole lot of times. But, you know, mentioned this earlier in the class, if you allow for a lot of different EPZs, you know, then you allow for also the possibility that one's going to roll a high evacuation rate, but the other one is probably going to roll, you know, a low, or at least when you have this many, that becomes a lot more possible. So you're going to kind of all converge around the mean, and you're probably going to undersell your true uncertainty. So we tried another analysis where we say, let's make them all one EPZ, so that way uh, you can get up in that upper end of the curve, like all the population at once can get, reach that upper end of the curve. And then Jordan also tried a scenario where it was like, okay, let's do that for most of the areas, these outlying areas, but in the cities where we think people actually did evacuate at higher rates will still allow for it. And in this assumption, we did get closer, at least in terms of our men now allows for what was in the uh, direct you know, life loss. So again, if you're trying to capture your uncertainty, this may be an approach to consider where you're trying to say, uh, let's assume uh, basically perfect correlation between all these areas rather than assuming they're all independent and can cancel it out each other's air. So key takeaways for this. Again, uh, we kind of think this is a semi-best case scenario for some of the evacuation that went on. Um, and, you know, a lot of these factors are things that you can't just go and implement, right? You, you can't manufacture 1970s close-knit communities with all religious ties and stuff together. Um, but this does let us know that, hey, at least this is possible, if not was possible, and for a lot of communities, maybe we should allow for, you know, even shift some of our curves up in that way, right? That, that's one consideration that we can take is trying to revise our approaches, allow for this rapid uh, evacuation if people get that true, you know, run for your life sort of warning message. So this was presented really just a few months ago. Um, I'm gonna say that other additional considerations, uh, debris not included in some of this, so maybe that could have contributed to why extra structures got flooded away. Um, but car traveling in and outside the area, should we allow for people to make what we kind of consider to be silly assumptions of, hey, uh, there's a flood warning of get out or die, and then people are still coming in to try to salvage some contents. Should we allow for people to do things like that? That's hard to model, uh, but maybe something that should be at least discussed qualitative in a, qualitatively in a risk assessment. Rescues, there were also, you know, kind of a trend here, some reported rescues. It's hard to say, you know, okay, were these essential in saving people's lives, but there are some planes, I believe, that landed and rescued some people out of uh, hard uh, places where maybe they could have been swept away. Um, but shortly after we had the Teton example presented to the consulates group within working uh, within USACE, we have the South Fork Dam. This is maybe the other uh, famous dam failure uh, that's commonly talked about within America, at least. You know, here we're going even further back in time, right? Um, so originally this dam uh, was built in 1852 and it breached in 1862, but that's not the one we're talking about. It was rebuilt in 1880s and then failed, and that's the one uh, we will be talking about. But it's upstream of Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Time. But so we're now in 1889 is the time of the failure that we're concerned with. Record rainfall that night, uh, flooding by noon, uh, rebuilt dam apparently did not have adequate spillway. It overtopped, breached, and uh, flooded the downstream community, resulting in over 2,000 fatalities. So yeah, I think that's, we say it's the deadliest dam failure. You know, more direct fatalities at least than Katrina. Um, just, you know, 1880s is where we're going on. So again, same concern, like how do you uh, pull in data for going that far back in time? Uh, luckily for our purposes, there was a lot of insurance data for fire purposes on exactly what structures uh, existed. I mean, sometimes you don't see data this good in the, in the modern day. These are actual building footprints for a lot of those structures. And some of these color-coded uh, buildings are for things like, hey, these are residences, and this is, 
your local tailor and whatnot. So you have actual knowledge on which ones are residences and are non-residential buildings. Uh, really important for um, creating your structure inventory. Where this data is coming from, you know, Kurt, who this one really recommends the Johnstown Flood Book from David McCulg, and also Al Rucker's Ruthless Tide. So some of these uh, maps being brought in from those sources, as well as just um, some of these are insurance maps. I think you went out and found from the primary sources. So likewise, you know, we have these uh, original data to bring in that had information on number of stories, construction types, occupancy types, and then you can create these maps. Uh, by geo-referencing them. So, you know, you pull this into Arc Map or what have you, you put that down in the modern sort of uh, imagery, and now you can go through and manually create dots uh, where those structures were located and with the attributes that are available from the insurance maps. So here's one of those examples. And again, you can see in this zoom imagery is like, okay, here's the church and the livery and whatnot. So great, rich data source for reproducing structure inventories all the way back in the 1800s. And here's kind of what that finished product looks like. So again, color-coded by occupancy type again, I believe. So residential and commercial areas likely going on corresponding with present day uh, terrain and satellite imagery, at least in here. All right, so how was population assigned? Uh, and this is, gets a little bit tricky and also tricky to compare to our modern day sort of uh, world. So, you know, average household size was a lot different in the 1800s. Um, you know, there was a local Hubert House. I think this was the hotel where there's 57 people. So there's some data. Why wasn't there a lot of over people over the age of 65? People didn't live that long back then. You know, he says here, life expectancy of 41 years back then. So that, again, you can start to see red flies, like, okay, are we able to compare this to our modern day approach? Uh, but again, it was also up and coming town as a working town sort of thing. So that's probably a lot of fairly recent people moving in there. Could also explain why there's so young people are so many young people compared to what we often see today. He's a little bit concerned as well because there's like an overrepresentation in the uh, average age of fatalities uh, among people that are fairly young. So it's like, oh, is this a, another flag that maybe Lysim should, should consider children separately from adults? But then we kind of looked at it more and said, well, actually, it looks overrepresented by today's standards. But you go back there and there's just way more kids. Um, people had a lot of children back then. and. Uh, fairly high infant mort mortality rates and everything too. But so it ended up being that, oh, we don't really think age played any part in this event anyway. So timeline of flooding, uh, you can kind of see the major sort of factors here. Uh, there are warnings going on to a certain extent for those that are familiar with this. There's telegrams coming from the dam saying, hey, maybe there's trouble. Uh, problem is uh, people said, hey, maybe there's trouble all the time apparently with this dam. And so that wasn't taken too seriously. Um, there's also just all this non-breach flooding that's going on beforehand. So well before, you know, we see uh, dam failure later in this timeline, people are already getting inundated uh, just by the non-failure flow. So people also are starting to evacuate by that non-failure flood. Uh, but some people are being trapped by the non-failure flood. And so even if they did get a failure warning later, um, they wouldn't necessarily have the ability to respond. Problem is, no one really got a failure warning. There was multiple telegrams coming out, especially as the dam, they thought it was imminent, but people that received it either laughed it off or basically made or made no effort to relay that to other people in the town or just didn't have the ability because the flood uh, came along so quickly. So we see here, dam breach at 245, viaducts breach 340, breach flood arise at Johnstown at four o'clock. So how were the initial results run? Uh, first, no breach warning made. Uh, you know, no effective dam breach warning reached the area. So that's a fairly reasonable assumption. Parameters all set to unknown. Wood structures, wood buoyant heavy. So this again, not assuming they're anchored to the foundations, but you know, this is fairly heavy construction back in the day, we'll say probably 
you know, log cabins or what have you, a lot heavier than drywall, um, probably a reasonable assumption. Uh, Hubert House, this is again that hotel that had a large population, um, partially brick, left at Woodpoint because it did collapse. So maybe that's a little bit of overfitting going on there, but fairly uh, well matching results in this case. Um, you can see again the top right uh, what assumptions were used in terms of uh, breach. Okay, just put it well after the fact so it doesn't matter. Non breach, okay, well before the fact. Um, but here you can kind of see. Uh, you know, if non failure flooding is really what people are responding to and getting trapped by, uh, then let's kind of focus on that for a second. You know, how do we assume people responded um, to this initial flooding? Uh, it gets complicated because, again, we don't have good survey data, you know, scientific method, not too huge in the 1800s. Um, but there are stories, at least, of hundreds of families heading to high ground. Um, how literally do you take that, you know? Flooding from two feet to two to ten feet from one end of town to the other by twelve. Okay, that might help us calibrate some of our timing aspect of it. You know, exodus of people, multiple areas, multiple area bridges destroyed by afternoon. So basically, it's saying here double warning method used within the non-breach area. Double warning is what we usually say. So you take the non-fail area and set up an an EPZ for that area, and they get an earlier warning. And then there's an incremental area for the failure flood wave. So we often will assume, oh, these people in the non-fail area, uh, they'll get warned well in advance because you're able to forecast non-failure flooding, unlike potentially a dam breach flood, right? So that's what we mean by when we say double warning. And this will become pretty critical here. But you can see the timing play out here matching fairly well with some of that timeline that we went over in the previously flooding starting at 6 a.m., ramping up, flooding portions of this town, cutting off some people, 720, 750 more. And then by 9 to 12 is really when this entire area is flooded. And 3 p.m., uh, deeper depths, but pretty much similar it starts to come. 445, again, zooming here, you can say, okay, uh, you're filling in some more areas, but really most of what's going on here is whoever was flooded before is just going to have a lot more water put on top of them. So flooding occurs in the morning, six to eight feet beforehand, but then the breach flood wave comes through and turns what may have been survivable at one point into something that is obviously, you know, extremely lethal, the most lethal dam failure in United States history. Additional 12 feet of water there. So again, if we're uncertain about how many people evacuate it, let's play around and see, um, you know, what makes it line up well. And it turns out the number that gets you the right answer that you want is 35% of the people evacuated. How well does that correspond with what we think happened? You know, again, we're working off of statements like hundreds of people evacuated and stuff. But what most historians and, and statements from the time suggest is somewhere between. Is kind of in that range that we think is reasonable anyway. Warning sensitivity time. So this is kind of getting into uh, how much time is it is reasonable to think that people had to respond to that non failure flood. If you're trying to back into the right answer, what would suggest is that, okay, close mat matches seven hours of warning for the non breach flood, you know, relative to, I believe, uh, the dam failure time. So you're kind of getting to that 6 a.m. sort of region when the area started getting flooding. So not assuming they had gauges and ability to forecast when it was going to come, but they were generally aware that, hey, this is a heavy rainfall event, water is starting to come up, people can get uh, out of there to a certain extent. So initial warning uh, prior to beach, 7.50 a.m. Uh, if what happens when you go through, say, warning delay diffusion, all set to unknown values rather than these kind of targeted sort of things. Uh, mean life loss of 262 compared to 220, so very similar sort of cases going on here. 888 structures collapsed. Uh, this is different by iterations and whatnot, but here we see life loss bound as unrealistic, uh, we think, when, when reeling that going here. I don't know. Um, I'd say it's hard to say what could have happened when we go this far back in time. Yeah, go ahead. So do you know if anyone's tried to flip the hydrograph and run this as a non-breach? I think 
They yes, actually, I, th I think we'll. I think there's a slide on that coming up here. Uh, spoiler: way less life loss. Yeah. Uh, so final estimate. So you know, again, uh, Kurt's trying to find out what makes the most sense here. This is a lit list of assumptions. You know, I won't read all this off to you, uh, but results on average: 35% mobilization. Uh, we're seeing observed life loss matching very well to this model sort of things. How much do we play into this? Okay, well, it gets into the whole, okay, if we assume mobilization rates that make life loss uh, correspond well to what we actually observe, then we get life loss uh, close to what we actually observe. You know, not a huge finding. Uh, we'll get more into the approach sort of aspect, which I think is more, more telling. Um, here's max depths for the area. Again, you are, you are saw hydrographic examples, but extremely high depths for a lot of this where life loss corresponds to it. Well, life loss was really wide, widely spread. However, uh, you see reddest sort of areas along here where depths are also the highest. Here is depth times velocity, similar sort of thing. A lot of the red areas going on here near confluence. And then superimposing life loss in it. Well, now you can't see <laughs> too much of the depths and velocities in there, but again, All right, so how well did life loss uh, correspond to what actually happened by spatially? But yeah, go ahead. Mm. Yeah, I don't think he used a road network in this case. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. It's such, and I don't think it would add any value in this because, again, uh, it's mostly this non fill area where we have a lot of uncertainty around the timing. Um, you know, there's no high and low clearance horses that you want to <laughs> plug into here and everything. Um, so I, I don't believe, may I'll be correct in a few slides if my memory's bad, but um, I don't believe there was any road network analysis, which we don't always use road network analyses for a lot of studies. Sometimes we'll say, either because it's kind of a lower level study and maybe we'll get to it if it matters. Uh, but oftentimes, you know, if we're in a situation where, hey, they have two days warning, we know from experience that congestion doesn't matter this far out. It's not worth it to model road network, spend weeks modifying your structure or your road network only to find out, okay, yeah, 0.1% uh, of my life loss occurs on roads and stuff like that. And even that is probably a modeling fluke that I don't really support, but yeah. So people teleport to safety as soon as they make the decision to leave their house in that case. Yeah, which isn't that huge of a simplifying assumption. Again, if, if you know you have days of time or whatever, you're really interested in that non-compliance rate at that point. Uh, people who either don't have the means to evacuate, you know, they don't have a vehicle and you have to evacuate dozens of miles or whatever, or they are just not willing, you know, they don't take the threat seriously or, you know, they have something that's keeping them from choosing or being able to evacuate, basically. Yeah, and so oftentimes we, you know, seen from some of these other, you know, things we've done that, hey, evacuating on roads takes five minutes, 30 minutes, two hours, maybe. Um, so if you're, if you have days in advance, then you know it's not really a huge simplifying assumption to just teleport people to safety. Uh, good question. I think I remember this coming up. I can't say for certain. I think it used modern day terrain. Um, I could be wrong about that. Uh, but you're also, you know, not placing structures and old pet channels and stuff like that anyway. So, um, I'm not, you know, we've saw some of those super, I don't want to go that far back, but those super imposed sort of imagery of old, uh, you know, channels and street locations, and they look pretty similar to today's, uh, you know, what's out there today. So as far as I know, there hasn't been huge shifts or anything like that in the channel. Um, again, uh,
overall, you know, life loss occurred in the rough areas that we generally expected it to. Uh, what happens when you use the MMC SOP? So this is again, going back to, uh, uh, we give people tons of warning for uh, the double warning sort of aspect of it. So the SOP is 72 hours before the simulation starts, uh, we give people the non-fail warning. Why do we make that assumption? Uh, in the old days, it was you know, fairly common to have crappy structure inventories where there's uh, st structures and rivers and whatnot. You don't want people started in the data and, and weird things happening where they can't evacuate. So as a simplifying assumption, it came pretty standard to say, let's get everyone out of the non-fill area. They are generally gonna have a forecasted warning. Uh, that's reasonable as an SOP. This is giving us reason to think uh, that's not great maybe for our low level analyses even. Uh, for high level analyses, you absolutely wanna spend a lot more time thinking about when would the non-fail warning occur just as you do of when would the failure warning occur. You know, there are a lot of flashy systems out there where people aren't gonna have you know, 72 hours, just get them to the max mobilization rates uh, where non-fail inundation can take them by surprise. Um, and you can see what happens if you assume that sort of, you know, extremely high, uh, you know, warning time in here, life loss plummets to 500, you know, uh, what a quarter of what was actually observed because they're all able to reach those max mobilization rates, which are generally associated with, you know, modern risk perceptions, modern willingness and abilities to evacuate and stuff like that. So another old difference here from uh, the case study. So non-breach simulations, this is getting to your question of what life loss looked like, mean of two. So incremental consequences from this failure, huge. And I got the one minute warning 30 seconds ago, so I'm gonna try to get through this, but uh, other sources of uncertainty, there was a lot of debris in this case study. So much debris, I wanna get to the image. No, we don't have the image in this one. There, there are like log jams up on bridges that you can see from some of these historic imageries. People got a lot washed onto those things. There was a fire on some of the log jam. People lost their lives in that way. Maybe some people, their lives were saved by it though. They were able to get washed into this high ground essentially. Uh, and a lot of people, you know, walked away from being trapped on there. But debris load is just, you know, hey, if a massive tree gets washed into your house, maybe that would walk, walk shit off the foundation more so than just uh, the floodwaters alone. But there's tree, a barbed wire factory upstream of Johnstown. This is, you know, we were saying before, oh, Teton is almost the best case example. This is going on the other extreme for some of this. So, uh, sorry, what? Uh, yeah. It's really certain, but you have all this, you know, whatever oil and other sort of stuff is going on, coal from whatever. Uh, it, it doesn't take much, you know, we, we see that in modern times too, when, you know, earthquakes and other sort of things happens, you know, fires and other stuff can be not too far behind. So actual life loss, um, victimless only have that, you know, there's uncertainty in a certain case of, hey, how accurate is this? You know, there is a case of someone being marked down as a fatality that showed up, you know, 11 years later. Uh, and so there's always gonna be some of that uncertainty, but I'd say it's, it's hard to imagine this being off by multiple factors or, or what have you. So we have a reasonable idea of this. Uh, you know, we do touch on the terrain here that, okay, we didn't see huge, channel shifts, but it's possible that some things uh, did change. I'm trying to compare this to modern times, technology, cultural changes are gonna be different. You know, there's stories of people helping each other move stuff to high ground and stuff. You know, you're, again, you're in the 1800s, fairly wilderness sort of town, and even if we say it's an up and coming sort of steel town or something like that, uh, you have different expectations of what you do to, you know, price save your family and stuff like that in these times than today different warnings and everything, especially uh, with that non-fail consideration. So key uh, takeaways, um, huge sensitivity around that non-breach uh, sort of aspect of this, especially the warning. Uh, forecasting gonna be critical. So keep in mind for your own studies, if you're in a flashy system, give a lot of scrutiny to when that non-failure flood is gonna occur and how people will respond to that. You know, some of the, uh, new research we've done for the PI rates does suggest people uh, will evacuate at higher rates for something, you know, scary like a dam failure than they would for flash flooding.